I'm Lucy Bernholtz. I'm a visiting scholar at Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society and the co-leader of the Digital Civil Society Lab here at Stanford Pact. So I actually started my career here at Stanford. I came here to do my dissertation in history and education. And the question that interested me then, which is now almost 25 years ago, was uh, what's public, what's private, and who decides? And through the leadership of my faculty advisors here, I was steered toward thinking about philanthropy in public systems, wrote a dissertation about private philanthropy in public schools, and I've been working in this space ever since. So the Digital Civil Society Lab is a brand new effort here at Stanford PACS. It will focus on engaged research, scholarly research, and policy work, thinking about how in the digital age, now that we're pretty sure the internet is here to stay, pretty, that's our starting assumption that, that it's not going anywhere, uh, we need to understand how we can continue to express ourselves, associate freely and privately, and continue to engage as a robust civil society using the full scope of digital tools, some of which we understand and some of which we're just learning as fast as we can. We are now at a point where uh, digital tools, so the internet access, Wi-Fi, cell phones that can do uh, an amazing array of things, even if they're just basic feature phones, are really, really pervasive. So we're kind of past what I think of as the shiny gadget uh, phase of this, where we're all just kind of enamored of whatever the next new toy might be. And we're starting to ask ourselves some of the harder questions, like if I'm being monitored by a uh, a government or a corporation, if all of the data I generate using these tools is being stored by someone else, how do I continue to protest my government? How do I continue to engage safely with my colleagues or my community uh, to make change happen if I'm leaving a digital trail of information behind me wherever I go? Similarly, we're at a point where nonprofits and philanthropists have access to tools that nobody imagined 20 years ago. So real-time satellite imagery and drones and using that uh, set of technologies safely and while protecting the privacy and rights of individuals, that's actually the whole uh, kind of role of civil society is to make sure that we as individuals continue to engage to make the world a better place. Uh, so we want to be able to use these technologies and, and learn all the things we can learn from big data sets and things like that. But we also want to make sure that we protect those basic abilities of ours to make those decisions without either government or corporate obligation or manipulation. So let me talk about this um, beyond the shiny gadgets. And I want to make sure we're talking about the same kinds of technologies. So there's lots of different technologies. There's um, a few in particular that people usually mean when they're talking just technology. And I'll talk about those. Um, those are communications technologies, computational technologies, the sensors that are in all of our devices nowadays. And where I think the, some of the most exciting stuff is happening is actually in what I would call institutional technology. So when we think about communications technology, we think about the ability to launch a fundraising campaign or organize a protest or share a message and generate interest in a cause more broadly, more quickly, and more uh, robustly than we've ever been able to do it. The practice is the same. It's sort of friends telling friends, but we can do it around the globe in a matter of seconds using Twitter or text messages or whatever tool we're using. So the communications role is where a lot of the attention has been. It's very exciting, it, and it's legitimately different in that scale and pace. It's really an amplification of the voice of individuals. So if you take well, to rip it right out of the headlines, um, last night's national moment of silence, um, it, a protest against police brutality in the US, organized by a very small group of individuals uh, in a matter of days, took place in, I think, 40 or more cities, hundreds of thousands of people participating. Um, simply not possible to organize on that scale that quickly in a, in a, matter, of, in a matter of days. Also, there was a huge backlash to it. So if that's, going, that's going to become one of these interesting case studies where you see not only how we can use these tools to create the change we want, but how others can use it to push back on the change we're trying to create. Similarly ripped from the headlines, the, um, the uh, National Association uh, doing research on Lou Gehrig's disease is leading this ice bucket, bucket of ice challenge, cold water challenge, I think it's called. They've raised more money than they could have imagined and this was a fundraising campaign that started outside the organization. It was started by individuals. So the interesting implication besides just this amplification role 
that these tools give us is that they're really changing the way you and I can make change happen, the scale at which we can do it with or without a structured institutional partner. That has big implications for philanthropy, particularly foundation philanthropy, which t typically can't fund individuals, can only fund an organization. So if the organization goes away because the individuals can make the change happen, we're going to have to see some changes in philanthropy. So that's the communications technology one, the one that we're all really carrying in our pocket with those cell phones. The other is computational technologies, the more common name of this, the buzzword that's being thrown around out there is big data. 